Today we have with us Dr. David Peck. David is a vice president for the University Relationships at Azuzu Pacific University. Peck's expertise lies in branding, marketing, public relations, social media, and visual storytelling. For 18 years, he has been responsible for promoting and protecting the brands at Azuzu Pacific University. Next, we have Diana Graber. She's an expert in digital literacy and is the author of Raising Humans in a Digital World, Helping Kids Build a Healthy Relationship with Technology. If you haven't read it, I say must have. Get it on your um, bookshelf. She developed and still teaches Cyber Civics. It's a digital lit literacy program that's currently being taught in 42 US states and maybe Diana has an update. I don't know if it's expanded beyond there. That was my latest statistics with that. Dr. Linda Durnell, she works at the intersection of media technology and healthcare for global social change. She's a member of the uh, World Health Organization's digital health roster of experts and they're tasked with developing strategy strategic approaches to the adoption of digital health solutions and products. Really interesting to hear about what they're doing there. Then we have Dr. Christian Aloma. He's the founder of Threadline, using narratives to design and create meaningful brand consumer relations. He has helped the world's largest brands improve well-being of consumers' lives, integrating both uh, behavior economics, psychology, and also narrative. We have Dr. T Tanisha Singleton. She's a marketing communications professional specializing in sports and fan experience. She has over 10 years of experience blended in business development, strategic partnerships, creative services, and brand management. We have Dr. Pamela Rutledge, who consults with a variety of clients, such as 20th Century Fox Films and Warner Brothers, to identify consumer narratives and behavior trends and anticipate audience and experience. Then finally, we have David Kaplan. Dave is award-winning television writer, executive producer of primetime comedies. He co-developed and currently serves as the writer executive producer of ABC's The Connors. And we also have Dr. Karen Wiley Rappaport. Karen is the founder of Signify, is an advocate for human-centered research to inform, inspire, and increase effectiveness of consumer experience. She uses data to understand the motivations of people as they incorporate media and technology into their identity. So you can see we have an amazing uh, panelist here today. Just a little bit about housekeeping very quick. We, we will have a question and answer period afterwards. Um, we will have you put it in the chat and we might occasionally be able to um, take you off mute to be able to have you ask your questions but it's really critical that you are careful with your post and your questions and be respectful and not have anything that would um, be considered harmful or inappropriate or uncomfortable for someone. I'd like to give a really special shout out in appreciation. We have a, a dual team here of PhD students. We have both Scott Garner and Jay Grant, who uh, a minute ago, I actually swapped their last names because it's that time of the day <laughs> after two days, but it's Scott Gardner and Jay Grant, who are going to be behind the scenes making this all look wonderful. So we really appreciate that. So now let's get started and let's start with education. We know that recently school districts, as well as higher ed, have been, especially the ones that are in hot spots, have been canceling school through the end of the year. So David, I'd like to ask you, what do you see as the long-term impact of COVID-19 on course delivery and also in recruitment for higher ed? David. Yeah, good afternoon and welcome uh, to uh, Huntington Beach, California, virtually, uh, where I'm actually uh, sitting in my car with a virtual screen in the background. Uh, it is great to join all of you. Um, I want to take you back to uh, March 10th, 2020, because I think that uh, we are constructing where we're going as we move. And I think there are a number of things that are going to inform our long-term future. Uh, it was a Tuesday in Azusa, California. We're on the edge of the East Los Angeles area and uh, Doppler 9000, a weather forecasting system detected a major rainstorm uh, that was gonna upset traffic patterns, general flow, and really our fast paced LA environment. Second only to New York, Los Angeles is a 24-7 town where the only thing that really stops us is weather earthquakes 
well in the Lakers and Dodgers. But even then, it's really only a pause. I was teaching both a face-to-face -face class on public relations entertainment at Azusa, as well as I was teaching at Field and Graduate University. Knowing that a number of my students face-to-face -face were commuting from internships, using public transportation, and are generally rain averse in California, I took class and I canceled the in-person section. And then I challenged them to do their work online, reading while watching videos and posting in the comment section. Can everybody hear me all right? Jerry Lynn, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Fantastic. The second thing that obviously was emerging was the rising concerns around COVID-19 and the potential issues of being an airborne virus as it translates easy, easy to others. To be honest, it was actually a major factor as well. By the end of the week, Azusa Pacific went online, and within another week, Governor Newsom, governor of the state of California, issued a stay-at-home order with schools, businesses, immediately transitioning to work and study at home. The state of California was online and in lockdown, an unprecedented act in our history. We, like many schools, gave students and faculty two weeks, including spring break, to transition home students and transition faculty online. As an educator and a faculty member, the academy has long argued the benefits and distractions of online learning. We've talked about how hard it is, how easy it is, and the pros and cons. Frankly, if we, if we spend as much time actually investing in it as we've spent talking about it, we as an institution of higher education would perhaps be at a different place. But in 14 days, the reality is higher education went totally online. Whether good or bad, we did it, and it moved quickly. From the standpoint of considering the short and long-term aspects of learning, higher education, when pushed, has the ability to change quickly and has the ability to adjust to new realities. I think that's the first and most important lesson that will affect our short and long-term perspective of learning is that change is possible when we're forced to change. And we do have the ability to adapt. We do have the ability to adjust. And we really do have the ability to pivot. The second key piece for me that emerged was really then the modality. My wife happens to teach third grade. Once her classroom was shut down, they quickly adjusted and moved toward multiple Google Hangouts each day. While she and her teacher and her partner worked hard to develop engaging curriculum, these were minimally attended as parents were trying to adjust to having limited bandwidth, limited computers, and trying to manage kids at home 24-7. Today, Governor Newsom for the state of California talked about the importance of rigorous education, even in an online environment. And so things like access, bandwidth, and giving teachers the ability, especially in the K through 12 area, the ability to co-construct a different engagement will be critical for our ability to move forward in a different way. I think what we've learned is that distributed, distributed platforms actually do matter. And as I looked at my class that went halfway face-to-face -face and then transitioned online, what I recognized as I, gauged with, as I engaged with these students is that many of them actually went home to situations where they were worse off from a learning standpoint, where they were in a crowded home situation, where they had greater levels of expectation, they had less access to technology or bandwidth, or, or they had less access to places where they could have individualized study. As an educator, one of the things I learned was that I also had to pivot in regard to how I was going to evaluate their success. And so I identified very quickly that learning, even from a higher education standpoint, required different ways to think about measuring outcomes and measuring the way in which we call success moving forward. So when we look at higher education, when we look at K through 12 from an engagement standpoint, we have the ability to pivot. We have the ability to adjust. We have to develop a little more grittiness and we have to understand that the end outcomes of how each person learns using sight, sound, and motion matter today more than ever. There was a recent situation in our home where uh, after dinner, our kids just spontaneously started speaking to uh, this uh, recent production of Hamilton that they had seen. And what emerged for me was their quick ability 
Uh, they saw it a week prior, but they had already memorized the music. But their ability to use music, to use video, and, and to use each other in dialogue to talk about the historical elements of our country through the lens of Hamilton. It was a really profound 20-minute conversation. And I was struck by the amount of U.S. history that they had learned through this show and through this production. I think that's another key piece is that we've got to learn to be creative and we've got to challenge those presuppositions around what has worked in the past, perhaps the sage on the stage, and then what will work in the future in regard to how we create engagement and creativity. I recognize that I've touched just a tip of the iceberg and that the long-term effects of what COVID-19 has done will drastically affect our future. Because again, our culture and our communities have seen that we have the ability to pivot, and I think they're gonna hold us accountable to new levels of engagement from an educational standpoint as we move forward. Wow, thank you, David, really interesting. So Diana, let's now turn to you, um, especially since you work in that middle school space. Uh, what in, in with the media literacy curriculum, which was so uh, critical right now, how do you see the role of media literacy in the uh, current environment? Uh, well, first of all, thanks to both you and Pam for inviting me to participate today. And I, I want to say there's not a day that doesn't go by these days where I don't appreciate my education from fielding because it's so necessary right now. Um, but just in terms of media literacy, that's really what I'm interested in. Um, through the cyber civics curriculum, we offer it over three levels of middle school. And the last level is all about media literacy, which is being able to use your critical thinking skills to analyze media messages. And I mean, I've always thought it was important. <laughs> right now, it's way, way, way important. And, and I think, you know, just looking at the statement that came out from the World Health Organization that we're not just in ex experiencing an epidemic, we're experiencing an infodemic, which I think we can all agree is way more serious right now. People are getting so much misinformation via their social media networks and everything else. And being able to analyze that information and be able to detect it when it's wrong and know what to do about it is such an important skill. So uh, I'm really fired up about teaching that to students because I think that's where it starts. So uh, as I mentioned, it's an integral part of the cyber civics curriculum, but there's really so much more to it than just being able to detect misinformation. It's knowing what to, what to do when you see it. You know, a lot of us will see things that we know are blatantly wrong on our social media feeds. And we know that the social media networks really let it fly by or mainly not doing a lot about it. So one of the big things that we teach kids is like, you know, don't just be a bystander in terms of cyberbullying. You know, be, don't just be a bystander in terms of misinformation too. So if you see something online that you think is wrong, you know, know how to flag it, know how to use your Facebook feed to say, hey, this is false news and to let someone know about it, or maybe even step in and let the other viewers know that it's in this information or don't like it because that's like giving it a vote or saying it's okay. So I think all those skills are so important, not just for kids, but, but for all of us. So we're really um, working hard on just perfecting that media literacy curriculum and getting it out to schools. And to answer your question, we're now in 45 US states which we're really excited. Yay! <laughs> Five to go. <laughs> but now that's good to know. Three more joined on. Yeah. But me too, only five more away. What, what's, no, what, gotta, what's gotta work on those other five. And I think we're in seven <laughs> other countries now too. So it's really, it's really cool. But there's so much more to it than just the media literacy. Like I think this moment has showed us that digital literacy in itself is very important with all these kids going online so fast. You know, it's twofold. Not only do they have to know how to, you know, interpret the information they see, but we got to make sure they're being safe and, and not engaging in cyberbullying or sexting or and all that stuff. So that's a part of it. Being a good digital citizen, knowing information literacy, how to use the internet as an information source. So I think really what we're seeing here is there's so much to learn so fast for these kids and for the teachers, as was mentioned earlier. These teachers were thrown online so fast, and I can't even tell you the number of teachers who have called us just pulling their hair out, trying to figure out how to effectively use Zoom or Google Meet or any of these other tools. So trying to get the teachers on board and having them understand how to use all this has been a really big project as well. Um, the other thing is we've adapted our curriculum to some of these things that kids and teachers are dealing with. Like we added a lesson in there about Zoom etiquette or video conferencing etiquette, because what we were discovering is when I, you know, did my first couple of Zooms with young kids, they would show up and have, 
you know, the Brady Bunch is really cute and everything. <laughs> Kids use all kinds of crazy backgrounds and they don't realize that when they're Zooming, that could also affect their digital reputation. So just teaching them those simple lessons about this world that's really, really changing. And then to answer your original question, like what's going to stick with us? I mean, this is a really horrible time, don't get me wrong. But I think that there's going to be some bright spots in terms of education. I mean, I've long been a proponent of online education. I, I think I learned probably more doing my master's online than I would have in a classroom because I like to read. That's just how I am. And I think for kids who like to read or maybe think independently and, and can do that work that way, there's a lot of benefits to doing online education. So I think what we're going to see going forward is this hybrid model. I think it will stick with us. I think as teachers get more accustomed to delivering things online, kids become more accustomed to doing things online. I think that we're going to keep that. And, I, and the other thing I think that's going to happen is I think you know, previous to this whole thing, we had most parents of particularly middle schoolers and high schools freaking out that kids were spending too much time online. And I think those parents hopefully are now seeing, Pam's laughing, she taught me this. <laughs> we talk about this all the time. Um, I think they're seeing now, hey, the online world is not the enemy. You know, there's a lot of benefits right now. Our kids are learning online. They're connecting with their peers online. So I think these reticent parents who are super fearful of technology are gonna come towards the middle. And I think on the other side, and I'm seeing this with the students I keep in touch with, the kids who thought the whole world just lived online, it's the best thing ever. They're saying to themselves, you know, the online, the offline world is pretty awesome too. And I really miss my friends and I miss face-to-face -face communication. So I really hope that we'll come somewhere in the middle in terms of parents, teachers, kids, and education. So that's my, that's my Pollyanna hope for today. So that's, that's a beautiful vision though. <laughs> I yeah. Got to put it out there because there's so much sadness right now in the world that I just hope that we can come out of this on the other end silver lining. As far as when it'll end, can't give you that answer. <laughs> Wish I could. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. So Linda, I'm coming to you next and about healthcare because healthcare has received a double whammy. You know, it's the front lines of uh, dealing with COVID-19, which we're seeing throughout the news every day, um, but also standard medical care and all those needs and how that can continue. And then how, you know, where has technology had the biggest impact and is telemedicine going to be the new standard? I know um, we at Fielding look at the whole uh, mental health care and, and delivery online and versus not. Um, so in the meantime, most business activities have been shuttering their employees, but healthcare can't. I'm just curious what your thoughts are, especially since you hover in this space. Linda, you're on mute. I know you were saying yeah. something wonderful. <laughs> Linda, you're back on mute. I don't know how you did that. There we go. We're good. <laughs> Technology innovations such as virtual reality, augmented reality, robotics, and AI have the potential to broaden how people live. But because of COVID-19, we're experiencing a new set of rules, and it requires a new relationship with technology. Before the worldwide pandemic, upwards of 14 billion was invested in digital health, and that includes digital therapeutics. And the investments by the military has not only supported 30 years of academic research in virtual re reality alone, but they're also investing in new technology um, for the warfighters, such as exoskeletons, drone solutions, wellness applications, and PTSD uh, training for veterans. However, we still appear unprepared for the pandemic. A recent example is a CEO I know of 11 cancer centers in Florida, and he emailed me this week, and this is what he said. His systems are now admitting 120 to 128 new COVID patients a day, every day. They are running between 95 and 110% occupancy. They're running out of staff. They're losing them to the virus. Testing is taking one to uh, five to 11 days to come back, and they are running a staggering staggering 30% positivity rate for new cases. It should be under 10% to control the epidemic. And the military groups I've consulted with have advised me that they are actively planning for COVID-20. However, there's good news here at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and they have started scheduling non-emergency medical procedures, hip replacements, neurosurgery, that type of thing. 
But a few of the technologies you asked about that are having an impact during COVID-19, I'm just gonna go through a few. And one of them is personalized and precision medicine. That includes super fast DNA sequencing, uh, tissue engineering, cellular reprogramming, gene editing, and it's assisting um, the efforts in finding a vaccine for COVID. The other one is a telehealth platform that you alluded to, and that is um, also considered remote medicine. It's a critical approach in the healthcare process during a pandemic. COVID-19 has pushed the inevitable telemedicine revolution forward by, I think, at least a decade, if not more. We are seeing a major shift in, uh, to decentralized healthcare and towards preventative care and home care. There's also telepsychology, which is helping more people access mental health care during the pandemic. Research is showing us that teletherapy is essentially, and this is a surprising, just as effective as face-to-face -face psychotherapy, and the retention rates are higher, and that's out of Northwestern University. Online cognitive behavioral therapy can allow people to develop resilience and other coping skills with regard to phobias, OCD, acute anxiety, addiction, eating disorders. Many of these issues have gone untreated while people are suffering in quarantine. People are using VR for pain distraction as part of their digital health platform. VR hacks the predictive coding system, suggesting that while in a VR experience, a person is not present in his or her body. In other words, no body, no pain. Using technology to treat pain at home without prescription drugs may be a good option for some during the quarantine. We're also seeing a shift towards more technology-driven training for nurses and medical students to assist during the pandemic. While augmented reality can make workers more efficient on task, VR offers faster learning with some learning situations proving a 75% retention rate versus only 5% using traditional lecture style methods. Medical students who use Microsoft HoloLens VR headsets to learn part of the human anatomy acquired that knowledge nearly half the time compared to students who studied only on cadavers. VR training is an optimal solution to skill up and educate workers while also decreasing the COVID risk. But assisting in the adoption and innovation during COVID pandemic is AI. Artificial intelligence can support providers with faster service, uh, early diagnosis, and data analysis. As an example, and this is interesting, it takes a radiologist three to four seconds to interpret an image. Even working eight hours a day for 252 days straight, a radiologist could not process more than 1.8 million images in a year Using AI for medical imaging processing, it is es estimated that more than 250 million scans could be read in 24 hours at a cost of $1,000. And lastly, we've got 3D technology, which includes printed face shields and 3D printed face masks for healthcare providers and others in need. The 3D printing is being used to design an adapter that converts breathing machines normally used to treat sleep apnea to emergency ventilators, as well as nasal swabs that are essential for testing. Technology companies are really trying to innovate our way through COVID. I think this is a huge opportunity for technology during this worldwide pandemic. And it is my hope and expectation that innovation will improve the human experience. Back to you, Jerry Lynn. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, really, really interesting uh, facts there. So, um, I'd like to turn to Christian now. Christian, how does this environment impact brands and how do brands sort of reach their uh, consumers in a meaningful way during the yeah. pandemic? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me, everybody. Um, really interesting uh, ideas already taking notes on for my own life. But, um, you know, one of the things um, that I have found interesting in my observation so far is you know, the, the crisis, the, the COVID crisis, and then every crisis that has piled up on top of it since um, has, I think, created this deep need from consumers to see a little bit more humanity in the brands that they're engaging with, right? And, and I think what we're seeing is this sort of, not maybe even a reckoning, reckoning in regards to, they want to know what these brands stand for. They want to know what's behind it. They want to know what they're doing. They want to know how they're helping. Uh, and it reminds me of, you know, when this whole thing first started and all of us got kind of that wave of emails of here's what we're doing for COVID, right? And, and everyone kind of chimed in there. Uh, I remember thinking about, um, I, I received uh, a, an email from Barnes and Noble and, and the email said, all it literally said was, uh, all of us are part of the community. We care during COVID. And I thought, 
they, it was one of those where it just felt like they just wanted to be part of the email wave, right? They had nothing really sort of meaningful to say, nothing, nothing prepared, nothing planned. Um, and I think that the challenge has been how as organizations who have traditionally sort of thrived on a lack of transparency, who have tr thrived on essentially sort of, you know, tiers and structures and, and just sort of a process that for the most part is blind to most consumers, how do they sort of to some degree open the doors, right? Open the robes and create a sense of transparency that builds trust when people need it most, right? And, and you know, I've, I've thought and talked a lot with my peers about this in the sense of it doesn't mean, you know, that the, um, you know, the, the company that makes drywall needs to come out and talk about how human they are. No, you don't have to do that per se, but you have to, with your consumers, um, focus on the way in which you can be human, that you care, that you can empathize with their experiences, right? Uh, and, and what we've seen a lot of, and I think the brands that are going to sort of survive all of this, are those that are connecting with their consumers beyond the transaction, right? Not even if, you know, I think about even some of those small businesses, even some of those online businesses who maybe, you know, they've got an algorithm that is powerful for helping them, helping people organize socks, if that's your business model, right? But if your algorithm helps you organize other areas of your life, share that with folks, right? Help people sort of engage with you, help provide some value to them, help create a connection with them um, that I think is, is, is meaningful. The other thing I think that has sort of really changed everything, and I've told brands this and, and their communication teams this, whatever you had planned and scheduled in Hootsuite, cancel all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Delete all of them because the context has completely changed. And, and as we know, context is sort of critical to meaning making, right? Context is whether or not you interpret something as being offensive or potentially funny, depending on how it's delivered. Um, and, and if we just sort of go about our business, if we just sort of try to ignore the changes that are happening, I think what we'll see are people make mistakes, people sort of misstep, people essentially sort of put their digital foot in their digital mouths um, and come across as essentially not caring. Uh, instead, what I think they need to do is to look at that context and see how has the context changed and how do we fit into that new context, right? How do we pivot our business model, right? Small businesses all over America are forced to do this from indoor restaurants now doing delivery and curbside delivery and all that sort of stuff. Every brand really needs to think differently about the way that they're connecting with this because the context has completely changed. So the stories that you tell need to change, how you deliver it needs to change. And, and, and I think it's not just COVID, right? I think as a society with, with uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, with um, you know, the election coming up, with, with COVID itself, and then every other issue that's going to pop up between now and 2021, you know, it is creating a sense of we have to, as organizations, listen more uh, and respond to what we're hearing, not just sort of force our communication strategy down people's throats. Um, you know, I think about oftentimes the Pepsi campaign from many years ago with Kendall Jenner. And when she stepped into the middle of a protest in South America and handed a riot officer a Pepsi, and it was like, oh, I guess peace, right? We've, we've resolved it because they're drinking Pepsis now. You know, if they take that sort of position, if they sort of try to fit themselves into a narrative that is not theirs, what happens, uh, and, and I, I think about my, my dear mentor, Dr. Oler, with this one, right, is if we push them out of the role of hero and try to be the hero ourselves, they will reject our narratives, right? They will reject our communications. They won't connect with us because we aren't empathizing with them. When this ends, you know, I, I, I don't know that it does end, um, and I don't know that it should end. I think COVID should end, and I think there should be equity and equality uh, across society, all these sorts of things. I don't know that our attention to what these brands are saying and doing should end. I, I think it may fade. I think we might find perhaps a little bit less sort of maybe free time on our hands to focus on what's happening on Twitter and, and, and Facebook and things like that. But I, I don't think that our attention, our sort of uh, focus and, and emphasis on the brand values that these brands are sort of communicating, I don't think that goes away. We saw it trending upwards with millennials and I think it's now becoming a much more widespread importance for consumers across the board. Well, thank you so much. And I can see extending that beyond brands. I think that that uh, what you had to say is so relevant in, in so many areas of life. Just one little side note, I happen to know, but I'm going to guess that if there's at least a few people out there that don't know what Hootsuite is. 
Do you want to explain to them real quickly when you told sure. them not to, not to use anything that they have loaded in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you don't know, Hootsuite is a social media managing tool. And if you're an organization, if you're a brand, if you're a company, even if you're just a person with a lot of accounts, uh, because that's how you like to roll, uh, it helps you organize uh, what gets posted, when it gets posted uh, to each of those accounts. And it provides also some, some feedback and some data in regards to engagement with those things and stuff like that. So it's very popular among um, media managers, marketing communication managers, things like that, in order to say, hey, on, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say, January 1st, we're gonna just plan a Happy New Year message and send that out. And people are planning those in advance and those are important. Um, but if you are planning a post that now might feel weird and you haven't deleted it, you, you could get caught. You could run into some, some unintentional sort of missteps because of it. No, great. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. Sure. So now we're gonna to go to uh, Karen Wiley Rappaport. And Karen, um, you are in that consumer space as well. Um, what what does this do to consumer research and how does that reflect back on messaging? Uh, yeah, so uh, Christian, you, you set me up very well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's so many layers of what is happening now. One of the most uh, recent research projects I was given was by a brand that said, um, oh, at least that there was an awareness that they couldn't say what they were planning on saying. But the assignment they gave me was to tell them what the post COVID message should be. Um, so in the research um, project, basically it was quite um, evident very soon that that was the wrong question. So there is not a what, you know, there's not going to be a clear line like this is what we said before and this is what we say after. So to your point, Christian, you have to um, have your finger on the pulse of what is going on. And I agree that the research also told us that um, consumers are really, and I've been seeing this for a while, when brands play in social media, consumers want the brand to act like a human. You know, don't, shout at me about shoes on sale one day and then the next day show me your ceo launching in something new and then the next day put a you know a plate of tacos because it's taco tuesday like don't just try to play in all of the areas so i've been seeing consumers push back on that mostly through social listening and so we could see in terms of research that we can follow behaviors and brands who are behaving consistently in human-like ways using um, perhaps archetypes as a surrogate for a personality for the brand um, tend to keep the people who are following along with their brand and have some sort of sense of loyalty. And that comes back to this idea that they're acting like a human. So, they're being consistent. When I see a post from them, I kind of know what to expect. Maybe I'm in a certain mood when we're talking about um, media usage and gratifications. I'm in a certain mood. I don't wanna use the usual suspects, but I'm in a certain mood and maybe there is a brand that I know will always have something uplifting to say or a brand that will always have something um, to take my mind off it, that type of thing. And so that's, people start to, in social media, show us that they're turning to brands like they turn to the other humans in their lives. And so what happened, we'll start with COVID-19. Probably most of you saw there was a YouTube creator that created a video called Why is Every COVID-19 Commercial? Uh, exactly the same. If you haven't seen it, you can Google that and find it. But they cut together all of the messages per Christian, you talking about the email that didn't make sense. And they were all the same. So every brand was, you know, using the same kind of music, using the same kind of images, um, wasn't able to do anything really original because they weren't able to get out and do any shooting. And the pushback was really strong from consumers. And it starts there. It's like, you're not helping. Why are you spending money like this? So we're, we're seeing consumers really perhaps because they have more time, perhaps because they're aggravated and anxious, but it's like, why are you wasting my time with this? 
And so it seems pretty simple to say that the brands need to be conscientious about how they're behaving and true to themselves, their archetype, their values, their mission. The thing that I would say is most brands don't know what that is. So that is why you end up with a situation where, um, you know, on, on Monday they're this and on Tuesday they're that because they might have a staff of people. They might have a staff of thousands of people that are all in the marketing department, you know, with different um, purviews and different things that they are in charge of. And they're, they're all kind of trying to fill the space. So that's the first step is to, for brands to take a step back and do some research to understand, either remember who they are or go back to consumers and ask consumers what they're allowed to be. So what's in their DNA. So what a, a, one brand can't um, not be true to itself or what's in its DNA and become something else overnight. And that's where consumer research can tell you. Now, this is something, it's really in consumers' hearts. They have like a space in their heart for certain brands and they've decided uh, sort of emotionally, psychologically, what that brand can be. And so you have to identify what that is and play in that space. And research seems a little bit difficult to do right now. So, I mean, the usual suspect would be like, let's have a focus group and get 12 people in a room with a moderator and show them some pictures or have them do a collage. So we have to be a lot more creative, but I think it's doable. It's just, again, it's not a quick overnight thing. So we can come up with a panel, we can do some social listening, we can collaborate with our consumers just like we collaborate with our coworkers and our partners through Zoom and the other tools that we have. But they will help us to understand where the spaces that we can play so we can really put a, by we, I mean my clients, we can put a stake in the ground and say, okay, this is what we stand for and this is how we're gonna live in this world. Now that doesn't mean that you have to take a stand on everything. Like Christian said, but you have to behave like a person with your brand's personality would behave in the situation. So for instance, um, if we think of what's going on with COVID or with Black Lives Matter, you know, some people are making sandwiches and some people are protesting and some people are anti whatever's happening, but they are being pretty true to their personality, you know? So if, if your is the, is the brand that makes sandwiches or passes out bottles of water, that's fine. Just show up and be kind of like arm in arm with, I don't even want to call them consumers anymore, your people um, and behave. So that is um, one thing that I came out of that with is that brands need to have a new filter and that's brand behavior. So, how would our brand, if we want to use archetypes and we are going to say our brand archetype is the boy next door, the girl next door, how is the boy next door or the girl next door going to behave in this situation? And that's a filter for our brand. Um, that said, I just saw yesterday a survey of CMOs um, on what their spending priorities are now, juxtapositioned against their spending priorities a year ago. Their spending priorities a year ago put research and strategy at the bottom of the list. And now it's at the top. So now research and strategy is ahead of data analytics and marketing operations in terms of where they're going to invest. I'm gonna not hold my breath to actually see that happen, but at least there's that consciousness um, at the CMO level that, you know, things things just are very different and we don't know what to do and research can help us inform the strategies that we're going to do and help those strategies and our whole staff, our whole marketing staff be successful. Wow, that puts us as media psychologists in a great space if, they hold, if it holds number one. Thank you so <laughs> much, Karen. I, I really posted it on LinkedIn yesterday so you can, you can all 
check we'll, it out. We'll all look for it. And if we're not, oh, I know I am, but if we're not already connected with you, we'll be connected with you on LinkedIn after that. So let's let's turn this over to Tanisha. I know um, there's many things that have been uh, designated as essential services. And for many sports fans, they think sports events are essential services, but other folks think otherwise. What do you see as the long-term impact on sports and events and the uh, sport fan experience? Sure, you know, I'd, I'd actually start with that. I think now in the thick of the global pandemic, sport is getting universally considered an essential service now, even for non-sports fans and people outside of the traditional sports space of fandom. Because it's funny to me because, you know, I explored the features that, you know, that build a multidimensional experience in sport. And I've been able to show that participation in digital spaces like activity and social media can positively influence social identity and boost someone's emotional stake that they have in sport. I think now that information is becoming more readily available and universally understood. But in the context of COVID, the plug's been pulled now on sports completely around the world. Everybody's like, wait, where'd that stuff that kept the people busy go? Like, where, we need to run sports back. Like, where, where is all of this stuff? But I, I don't think people are screaming that because they care about player statistics and watching folks run up and down the court. It's because sport has been a source of esteem and validation for people since before the wheel. And the cultural ramifications behind sport are huge and has a a huge impact in regards to, you know, the pandemic and COVID right now and the relearning that a lot of people are doing. You know, I'd, I'd be remiss in not pointing out that, you know, as a black woman and a ridiculous sports fan, I get asked all the time from my friends that are non-sports people, you know, why do you care so much about sport? Like parts of it are exploitative and it's gross. Like, what's your deal? And to be completely honest, it wasn't until I didn't have sports anymore that I realized part of the answer to that question and for me, it's because in no other arena can I find someone that looks like me succeed regularly. Outside of sports and entertainment, which Black culture has been the epicenter of, there's no other industry or business venture that consistently promotes, includes, and highlights Black excellence in some way, shape, or form. Sports does. So much of the Black community looks at sport because of that. It's representative and a platform that people want to use for more social change. And we're seeing a lot of that now. And that's a part of the new normal of the sport experience. So to touch a little bit more on COVID specifically, that we've got sports unplugged, we're seeing the very ill-advised political push <laughs> on bringing sports back. Um, because right now, look, all we've got is cage fighting and cornhole. I'm not, you know, dissing either one of those. I love both equally for very different reasons. But the point is that without a consistent stream of sport that we've all grown accustomed to, people have become a little lost and they've been forced to find new means of value. So sport as an essential service, it doesn't come from the box scores or the stat lines. The competitive elements, the ability to transport into sports narrative, to be able to marvel at elite athleticism, that's one thing. But more importantly to call out, it's that this pandemic has removed a delivery mechanism that people use to be emotionally connected to something, to something greater than themselves. So people have been unplugged from their sources of esteem and connection. And that's the true meaning behind sport as, as an essential service. I do wanna say that now that sports, a lot of brands are using sport now um, and repositioning it as a prompt. And this is a prompt for conversation and social programming and social action. It's ironic that it took the absence of sport to bring that to, <laughs> to bring that to everyone's attention. But we're seeing that, you know, like right now with the NBA, for example, that's, you know, as they're developing this return in a bubble in, in Disney, um, but at least they've allowed the players to put custom messages on the back of their jerseys. So instead of their last names, instead of saying James Harden or Lillard, you're going to see Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter, and vote. Each player now has the opportunity to put their own message on the back of that. And that's huge. That's, that's, our, that's our now normal with, with sports and you'd be using it as a platform for something greater. So to try and encapsulate all this into more of the, the fan experience part of things, especially present in post-pandemic life, I think 
one thing that can be used as a framework to look at that is something that I've called the three E's, emotion, engagement, and experience. So for emotion, that's, that's realism, okay? That's, realism is more important than perfection, okay? So that's being humble and authentic. Athletes, leagues, every sports marketing affiliate is getting that memo now because in being humble and honest, it's better than being flashy and forced per the points of what, you know, Christian and Karen just talked about in terms of branding um, and not looking, you know, forced or phony and inauthentic that can, you know, build rejection as opposed to retention, which is what we're all looking for. And people are exhausted. You know, I know I am. And so there's no cute noir, you know, Instagram filter for your brain. So it's like, let's be honest about it. And public figures ought to remember that we're in the people business. We're all selling something to people, not other robots and stuff. So it, it, it behooves you to, you know, to use psychology to look into what consumer insight and what consumer behavior and what builds emotional resilience, because a lot of people are stressed for a lot of different reasons right now. Um, so that's the emotion element. For engagement, I think there's, there's still obviously plenty of room for escapism and for laughs. You know, not everything needs to be about the struggles of life. And so there's a lot of prompts right now, I think, um, within the sports space to show positives of the human experience. And a lot of sport affiliates from athletes in locker rooms or quarantine training uh, bubbles and workout rooms and all the way to brands that are affiliated with them, they're, they're using social media to launch programming that's a little bit more lighthearted or entertaining and even, you know, more self-care oriented, you know. Um, and from a, you know, a organic booster club standpoint, for example, I ask you all to look up the Black Girl Hockey Club. I'm on the board of directors of them, and that's a nonprofit org that focuses on making hockey more inclusive uh, for the Black community at youth, minor, and professional league levels. And they've been putting on a series of regular events virtually now, obviously. And so and they've got one on the 25th coming up that's dedicated to radical self-care. Um, and they have players and affiliates from NHL involved in this as well. So that's a great you know, example of fan engagement that is actually promoting action. And now professional leagues are looking at fans for insight and advice on what they should have been doing from the beginning. Um, and lastly, for the experience part, it starts with passion. It starts with passion and it leads to a vision to share it with the world. And experience is contagious, especially within tight communities. So when you're providing forms of complimentary content to you know, fulfill the gap uh, of, and lack of sports right now, that helps sustain the emotional connection that people have. So that head and shoulder programming model, like we're seeing now that it's more important than ever, right? You've got the game, that's the head. That's the thing that everyone is, everything is meant to support. And then you've got the shoulder programming and that's all the feature stories, esports, fantasy, and all those things that help uphold and sustain the event itself. So this is all we have right now, right? And people, brands and leagues are getting caught with their head somewhere because they realize they weren't investing in this area to begin with. Um, so, and that's, that's super important. And another quick example I'll share with that is, is with writing and fighting. I'll ask you guys to look that up too on Twitter and YouTube um, and on my website that I'll share. But writing and fighting, it's a digital series that I've been humbled to co-host with a colleague of mine, Professor Nancy Kidder at American University. And using her foundation that she's built within the classroom, we've been producing a bunch of regular events um, virtually right now um, on the culture of combat sports and its intersection with history and literature. And we've created this platform and we've had top shelf UFC fighters, promoters, boxers, sport historians, and a lot of media members to share their experiences. And it's become tremendously insightful because now we've been able to create a very transmedia experience around sport to help educate and inform in the lack of, of sport right now. So that's, um, I'll kind of wrap with that and, you know, and say again, as, as sport as an essential service during this pandemic, if you look kind of at those three E's, if you focus on that framework between emotion, engagement, and experience, you can look at how to sustain fandom in the wave of a, a global shutdown. And you may, you may just make some new fans out of it. Thank you, Tanisha, and also um, if, if you if folks on here haven't checked out the program that she's talking about, that she's doing with the professor from American University, it's really worthwhile. Do you want to see the name of it one more time? Yes, the, the nonprofit org is Black Girl Hockey Club, and then, um, yeah, it's blackgirlhockeyclub.org. Um, you can also, I've posted some stuff about that on LinkedIn. If we're not connected already, you can just find me there from my full name, and then also writing and fighting, that as well as should be all over Twitter and LinkedIn. 
Thank you, Tanisha. So Pam, now let, what do you, let's look at other forms of entertainment. Will we ever go back to the movies or are we gonna be doing Netflix for life? You're on mute, Pam. Pam, you're on mute. Yep, okay, got it. I was being such a good citizen. Um, so the, this battle between movie theaters and video on demand that was already underway. So this, that isn't really new news, but it, and it's kind of a metaphor for a whole bunch of other issues. COVID-19, as everybody's saying, changes everything. And it isn't just change everything for a month, it's changing things very fundamentally. It's not just this rapid adoption of technology that's being used to fill or bridge gaps. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's home entertainment or Zoom. There's this assumption that once things open up, it's all going to go back to some kind of normal. But the question isn't when can people go back to the movies? It's whether they're willing to go back to the movies. And I think that's a really important question because this cost benefit analysis that we always make, you know, what, you know, the good and the bad and the forces between movies and video on demand isn't just comparing the things that we used to compare. It isn't just access, desirability of the movie or content or the cost. It's gonna be driven first and foremost for the near term and possibly for the next year by psychology and by people's need for safety, perceptions of danger and their willingness to tolerate risk. Now, thanks to the pandemic, as everyone's been saying, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a very thin veneer of control over people's emotions today. They feel vulnerable, uncertain, and under attack. And anxiety and uncertainty and fear have reprioritized this decision set for everything. And that's what's not going away. As the narratives around COVID-19 show, people don't all do the same thing, right? Some fear the spread of virus and the loss of life. Others are worried about losing their rights or inhaling carbon monoxide out of their masks. It doesn't matter. Fear is fear. And no matter what we're afraid of, it makes our response to things reactive and primal. So from an evolutionary perspective, there's all kinds of approach and avoidance systems at the functional and neurological level. The long-term disruption from technology use and the new behavior patterns are gonna be determined more by these basic forces than the simple things such as, have I seen that movie before? there's going to be a fundamental trade-off between the drive for social connection and the feeling of control versus the drive for safety and the willingness to tolerate risk and the sustainability of those drives over time. So to estimate whether people are going to return to activities will mean trying to assess the comfort level associated with each activity relative to need. So if you can make actually a matrix out of safety and activity based upon need, and you can plot the likelihood of each, right? Restaurant dining is used as a proxy for movie going. But restaurant dining is going to recover way before movie going because food, food is a survival item. Um, and so it's easier to risk, rationalize the risk. Restaurants are well lit. You sit, don't sit with people you know. They're supposed to be clean, right? And, you, you know, you don't, they don't have to be that close to other people. So restaurants are going to be a leading indicator and not a proxy. Shopping malls also have stuff people need. Shopping malls are also used as a proxy for theater going. Shopping malls have lots of interior space. They allow for social distancing. They have their lit, right? You can see, but more important, you can get in and out in a very short amount of time, right? Interactions are at a minimum. In the current environment, Movies in theaters is going to be a very hard sell. Think about your metaphor of a theater. Theaters are dark. You can't see the dangers, right? You sit next to total strangers. Uh, you know, my memory of most movie theaters, is the floors were a little bit sticky. And there's popcorn. Others are touching the same thing you are. And entertainment is a luxury item, right? So if you say, well, where am I going to put that on the risk matrix, it's not going to look very well. And financial need or distress from lack of social connection or even the desire to demonstrate, you know, some agency or control by engaging in what I would think of as a symbolic action of the pre-pandemic days. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go to the movies no matter what. Well, that would make a difference in this perception of safety. And the, it won't change the relative safety of each one of these things. It doesn't make the movies safer than a restaurant. 
right? All it does is change your willingness to withstand risk. So the real challenge is going to be thinking about where movies or any other event, like Tanisha was talking about these various sporting events, where they fall on this matrix. Because as the pressures driving the need for caution diminish until there's like a vaccine or herd immunity, this, because this relative safety doesn't change, unless you can free frame the use of any single entertainment thing. And I think that's what's really powerful, Tanisha, about what you were talking about, which is you're really saying that it isn't just sports, right? It's really offering people a chance to, to be, be inspired, to, be, to aspire to be something. There's a whole lot more going on that's, that's very driven by identity that's very important. If movie theaters can figure out a way to frame what they're doing with that potential lever, they can really help reframe the perception of going to the movies as a different kind of activity, something that is almost a form of self-care. You know, but what, what they're up against, whether it's Netflix or AMC, this is, isn't gonna be just restricted to them. This complex trade-off at least for me, the price versus ease of access, those aren't going to be the defining moments. And, you know, and I think Christian, Christian, to what you were saying, there's, and, and I think Karen, you were agreeing, was that there's this long-term shift towards values that's really redefining people's priorities. And so I think while it's horrible right now on net, that could be a very positive shift. Thank you, Pam. So, Dave, you're gonna wrap it all up for us. Um, it's, we, we know that uh, entertainment has played a huge role in keeping people sane while sh sheltering in place, much like the Netflix that we brought up. Um, what's, talk about your experience with mass media storytelling and the psychological considerations of what people want during a crisis. All right, well, thank you. Um, I just wanna say, pleasure to be here with all the, the talented and esteemed alumni. So this, this is great. Um, so I'll be the, the mythical correspondent from Hollywood and tell you that content creators for mass media are shaking in their shoes right now. People are trying to suss out what the psychological needs of their audience are. And there's a lot of money at stake, obviously, of starting movies and television shows in a time like this. So as an example, the networks that normally pick up shows during this time to, to produce were very conservative and very stingy with what they picked up because everybody's trying to figure out what the audience's needs are at this moment. And all the content creators for new and existing shows, mine's an existing show, they're trying to weigh relevance versus escapism. And that's a pretty high stakes uh, poker bet right there, because if you guess wrong, you can lose your audience. Um, it's interesting, one of the things we looked at actually was this YouTube show that John Krasinski had called Some Good News, right? And it was just what the doctor ordered when COVID started. And as Pam related to, you know, there's a, a, a kind of a reductive, a uh, set of needs that, that, that kick in when people are afraid, right? Um, it becomes a very primal thing. And so he had the good news and it was volunteerism and it was kittens and it was, it was fun stuff. And it was just what everybody needed. And then when Black Lives Matter really started, that show was just done at that point and Viacom actually bought it to make a bigger show out of it. But how would that show have fared against the background of Black Lives Matter, right? It would have felt different. So this, this relevance versus escapism thing is a bit of tricky business. So what is it that audiences want? There is a show that during these COVID months, the last four months, has been far and away the biggest show in America. I'm going to let you ponder what that is for a couple of minutes, just so you can take your guesses, okay? because I was a little surprised by it too. What people want for an audience has become a tricky bit of business to figure out anyway, because the audience is so fragmented now. So when I started doing this, low those many years ago, audiences for a show were 35 or 40 million people, and it was much easier to make, gener make you know, generalized kind of guesses about things. 
Um, now a lot of shows are a million or under a million. Network, we still get anywhere between five and 10 million for a, what's considered a, a, a hit show. So what people want and what they're going to relate to in terms of mass media storytelling is gonna change, obviously. And this is kind of a uses and, and gratification model. It changes based on who they are, right? So uh, age, uh, cultural considerations, political orientation, all these things enter into what people want. But how can we make some kind of generalization about what stories people are, are looking for? Now, it's interesting, there's very little literature about what people want in a crisis in terms of their mass media. So um, I went back to 9-11, which was you know, a crisis that had some things written about it in terms of the mass media. And one of the theories that came to the fore after 9-11 in terms of media was terror management theory. And for those of you not familiar with it, the, the, the brief thumbnail is that, uh, that we suppress our fear of death, right? Um, mortality salience, as they say. And when it's brought up to the surface, how does it affect people in terms of their psychological needs? And that theory states that people want two things really when they're faced with this kind of fear and this kind of danger. Um, they want to reinforce their worldview and they want to know that they're capable of action, that they have some agency or self-esteem. And a third thing, just as important, is they want to connect with people. So that's one of the interesting things, one of the conundrums of our moment is that in this fear, we want to connect and we're being told, don't, don't connect, or at least certainly don't connect in, in person. So it's, that's one of the things that's creating so, so much fear and anxiety, I think. So there were some researchers that used this terror management theory to say, okay, well, how did that affect the media? How did that affect TV shows and movies that people wanted? There was an uptick after 9-11 in shows about ju that, that emphasized justice, catching criminals, making sure that the bad guys got what they wanted. It was a reinforcement of the cultural worldview that everything, everything eventually is going to be okay. Um, and so that was kind of, that was kind of a biggie. Um, I went and looked at what shows people are watching today. From a movie standpoint, it was pretty interesting. In the very early days of the COVID thing, Contagion, the movie, was the number one download. And that's, that's what people wanted. Um, that was very brief. Following that, and currently, it's more escapist fare. So um, a few of the things that are in the top 10 in terms of uh, movie rentals right now are The Matrix, um, Avengers Infinity War, um, uh, what else? Uh, Inception, otherworldly, very escapist kinds, kinds of things. Um, so now we'll, let's get to what the number one show is and the number one genre at the moment. The number one genre far and away is comedy. And the number one show far and away across the country is Friends, a 25-year-old sitcom. So what do we make from that? Well, if terror management theory and this kind of re this fear that reduces us to primal things makes us want to connect those parasocial bonds of people we know very, very well, of Rachel and Phoebes and Joey and what have you, um, that is a very strong draw for audiences. That's very comforting. And so we get to what I think people might want from mass media storytelling, and that's relationships, parasocial relationships especially as we can tell from friends, the older bonds that they have. So it'll be interesting to see as we go forward whether new shows can get traction during this time or whether people want existing shows where they know they have parasocial relationships with these, with these people already. So that kind of brings us to whether we think that the, there's a short-term effect or a long-term effect to mass media storytelling. It's probably short term during the crisis. Long term, it was interesting after 9-11, even though there was an uptick in justice shows, after proclamations that entertainment will never be the same again, it took about 90 days for television and movies to look kind of exactly like they looked before. So there was, there was a kind of an anxiousness to get back to what we knew. But in the short term, 
I think people want a certain amount of comfort and a certain amount of escapism. And uh, I hope I'm right about that. Otherwise, my show is going to go down the tubes. But um, well, <laughs> even if it does, I'll have tremendous data for some kind of paper. So uh, either way, it's going to work out great. So um, yeah, that, that's about it, Jerry Lynn. That's what, that's what we think people want, but we'll find out. Thank you, Dave. You know, I really truly thought it was going to be your show that was going to be the number. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope it's one of them, yes. <laughs> so, um, but, well, really interesting. And, and when you said that, it, um, what I was reviewing in my mind is my husband and I have been watching movies over and over again, some of our favorite, as opposed, at a certain point, I think we got fatigued with the whole Netflix search and trying to figure it out and that I felt comfort in that so that, that falls right in line with um, those psychological correlates that you were talking about. Well, we did such an amazing job of discussing that we had six minutes total. Um, and I'm hoping that our, our two students extraordinaire have been gathering up some of the discussions and maybe they'll just feed them to us or tell us who we should unmute. So Jay and um, um, Scott, and I don't know um, our assistants here, our tech people, how we unmute them. There we go. Yay. <laughs> There's you Jay know, at least. Scott must be kind of zooming in somewhere. So he is probably coming back. There you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I don't know where to start. We had several good questions come in and they were coming in as you were talking. So they're relevant to each um, area, but we can go back um, quickly. thought there was a good one, I think, um, for parents. And I, I know Stephanie um, Girac had posed this, so she might want to come on and, and ask. But um, trying to, to weigh that uh, balance between screen time as a good thing and screen time as a bad thing. So screen time is a good thing for distance learning, but as a, a maybe a potentially harmful thing for uh, that we've been told. Uh, so the, the, the too much, never enough. See what I did there? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that one? I'm happy to hop in because I, I saw that question and I had some interesting thoughts on it. And I, I think one of the things I've always had an issue with when it came to screen time is the fact that we blanket it screen time, right? And we don't think about what is done on the screen and how we use it. Um, and, you know, that was, I remember from the very sort of first few courses in the program, learning about a lot of the misperceptions of the actual impact of screen time on people's experiences and m mental health and, and well-being and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, I think the point was made in the discussion, and I think it was a really good one, which is um, we shouldn't demonize screens, right? That we, we, we should sort of demonize what we do on those screens. And, and, you know, someone said scrolling Twitter for 30 minutes doesn't feel the same as reading a book for 30 minutes on a screen. Um, because I think there are very different, both, I think, ways in which we engage with the screen, as well as the emotional sort of reward we get from each one of those activities. Um, and and I'm, I know there's tons of, of research that goes into, right, the, the, the pings of social media and what that does to us versus just about anything else. And so uh, I think it, it's raising this really interesting question right now and forcing everyone who said screen times are bad. And I think it was uh, Diana, uh, you sort of raised that point in regards to, um, you know, people who thought, you know, their kids were using too much screen time force them to use the screens all the time and see how much they're willing to get outside after a while, right? Um, and that sort of thing. And so uh, it was interesting to hear that and, and comment on that. It's interesting you said that because I used that analogy with my children a few times. It wasn't with screens, but I think at one point when they were fighting over donuts, I let them each get a whole dozen donuts a piece. They never fought over donut, donuts again. So uh, a, a, a good analogy. Anybody else want to jump in real quick about the, the, the uh, this topic, or should we take the next question? Diana, you're muted. Diana, you're muted. I can just say one thing about this, Jerry Lynn, because I get asked this question probably about 18 times a day. But I think this the answer to this question is really dependent on the age of a child, you know? I mean, because I saw someone refer to really young kids, and it's important to remember for those really young ones, they still need that face-to-face -face interaction. So even during this time of COVID, like that, I think that they, we need to be 
remember that with our really little ones. But with the older ones, you're absolutely right. I mean, the stuff they're doing on their screens right now, it's kind of cool because they're learning things and they're connecting with their peers. And so I think the previous screen time rules that we had pre-COVID have kind of gone out the window. And everyone now is looking at what are they doing instead of how much. And I think that's pretty cool. Great. So, James Scott, next question. Uh, I, I wanted to bring up one that um, was kind of answered on the board, but I thought was an interesting question. Um, Valerie Sands asked Tanisha her thoughts about canned fans in terms of using technology to create fake you know, applause and uh, things like that. And I was hoping Tanisha could possibly expand a little bit on what you responded, because I found what your response was quite interesting. Sure, sure. Quickly to kind of summarize, if you don't know what canned fans is, now that, you know, some sports are being forced to return soon and without live audiences, they want to pump fake crowd noise in the arena for like, you know, and they're even limiting, obviously, the amount of arenas that we're going to. So even home game, away game, that stuff's going to be obsolete soon. So they just want to pump in fan noise to get the athletes hyped. And then also they're going to try and transcend what the live experience is like from the couch or a bar stool because even that now is, is you know as eliminated um the comments that i was making um to try and answer in the chat was that i think that that's going to be a real-time experiment and they're going to see how that goes many athletes at least in baseball have already disowned it and they're like please don't and korean baseball that's was one of the first to start early as well um because they know how to handle pandemics and so they've been putting like mannequins in seats and stuff. So the guy in the third outfield is like, we what? And so it's, it's a weird thing that I think is gonna be um, kind of trial as we go and see, but I think they're gonna pull that or can it, no pun intended, once they see that how it plays over on television because it's the television ratings and stuff that's gonna prove the success of this or not. They obviously um, you know, are willing to risk health and safety um, for dollars. So I think about the can fan stuff, a lot don't like it. A lot of fans have already, I've at least, you know, seen in, in, in digital spaces talking about like, please don't, why? Like we, we know what's going on. Just play, you know, Quad City DJs as like the hype song and keep it pushing. Like they're also, the NBA at least is looking to up the microphone so that we can hear the players. Now the UFC, that was the first one that was going and that's been amazing from a, fan experience on the couch because you can hear not only the coaches giving tips to fighters in real time, you're also hearing the commentators reacting because that's their job as color commentators and now athletes are responding to the commentators. So it's a fun dynamic in that regard and it gives it kind of a fight club feel. But for team sports, very different. Um, and I think that they're gonna, they're gonna can the can fan noise because it's just why. We know it's not, like, be real. Like, we know there's no fans. You don't need to fake it. That's a part of being authentic. Thank you so much, you guys. We're at the hour. We're, it's, it's time to wrap up this whole symposium. It was a great two days. I know that this group could be together for another two, three, four hours discussing. Um, I'm going to try to get Scott and Jay to grab our chat because there were a lot of questions we didn't get to, and maybe we can find a way to uh, send this out to folks. Everything um, has been recorded and uh, a lot of it's already posted, but I expect by tomorrow things will be posted. So if you go in where the schedule is, you can find the recordings and that should be available to you. Uh, the, and uh, I wanna thank everybody. It's been a, a terrific two days. I look forward to not the preparation of, but the experience of doing this again and coming together again. I have to say it was a lot of work, but, and there were a lot of people behind the scenes making this all look, look good. So anyway, thank you everybody. Have a great rest of the day. And thank you um, all of our panelists for sharing your thoughts and insights with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.